Okay, we're picking up Act 1, Scene 3, around line 55 or so. Um, if you would, underneath the 203018, sign your name and then the last person bring it back up to me. <clears throat> so we're at Polonius' house. We just finished with um, Laertes and Ophelia talking, Laertes giving Ophelia, you know, relationship advice, so to speak, telling her not to sleep with Hamlet. Really not so much that as Hamlet's out of your league. Stay away from him. And she's like, okay. Laert uh, Polonius comes in and he sees Laertes is still there, kind of ashamed him for not having already left, but then says, let me give you some advice. Line 55, 55. 58, these few precepts in thy memory, look thou character. That is, inscribe these in your memory. This is going to be important because this is an idea Shakespeare's going to play with throughout the play. All right? Um, we're going to hear the ghost tell Hamlet, taint not thy mind, that is, with these thoughts of revenge and such. And then Hamlet is, shortly thereafter, going to wipe away everything on his mind and replace it with the two words, kill Claudius. So memory and writing in the mind and such are kind of important. So write these aphorisms, these proverbs in your mind. Laertes, give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Give thy thoughts no tongue. Don't share your ideas. Don't share your opinions nor any unproportioned thought his act, nor, yes. nor, what? Don't act without thinking act first. Don't do something without thinking of the repercussions, consequences, you know, take that, that idea to its logical consequences before you act on it. Good advice or bad? Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Your gloss tells you common. Eh, it's not really what it means. Vulgar means wearing out your welcome. If you've never been to a party or never hosted a party that you have kind of set times for, you know, beginning and ending time. We've had a few, my wife and I have been married nearly 40 years, uh, nearly 39 years. And over those years, we've had a few get-togethers, start at five, finish at 10 or 11 or whatever. And there's, a, without fail, in every one of them, there's been someone who has stuck around. And it's like, you know, you put on your pajamas, you turn the lights out, and they don't get, that, that's what he's talking about. Don't be so out and about that people get tired of seeing you, all right? Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel, but do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. That is, friends that you have and you've proven their friendship. That's the word tried. You've proven that adoption. Like they're like a sibling to you. He says, those friends, tie them to your soul, like steel. Don't let anything happen to that friendship. But don't dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched unfledged comrade. That is, don't wear out your hand of friendship with every new person you meet. You know, um, I remember reading years ago, I don't remember who was running for election, somebody was running for president, and there was an article about, again, I have no, I have no idea who this even was about. But I, what I do remember is the candidate talking about hands being sore at the end of a day because of going out and shaking so many people. That's what he's talking about. 
Don't assume that somebody you've just met is someone who will stick by your side through thick and thin. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but be an end, bear it that the opposed may beware of thee. Beware of entrance to a quarrel means what? Don't get in an argument or fight. But notice, if you're in one, do what? Win. Win by, you know, just a little bit? No. If it's a verbal argument, so utterly destroy your opponent that they know, I'm not going to get in an argument with this person again. If it's a physical argument, so bloody that person that he or she knows, I'm not going to get involved in a fight. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. What does that mean, give every man thy ear? Listen to what everyone says. But keep your thoughts to yourself. That's the, the keep thy voice. Take each man's censure. That's part of giving every man your ear. Only this implies what? If you're being censured, you're being criticized. You're being taken down. Give every man thy ear. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Hey, you know, I don't think you're doing so good about this. Oh, yeah? No, oh, yeah. Just take that criticism and grin and bear it. Don't respond. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, that is well made, but not Gaudy, that is, not flashy. You know, you go to work for a Fortune 500 company. You're starting out, entry-level position. You don't go, go buy a $5,000 suit to work in the file office. Maybe if you're made a partner in a law firm, then you get the $5,000 suit or 10 or whatever, okay? Why? Because the apparel oft proclaims the man. We may think we're above this, but what do we all tend to do? We judge people by how they dress. We judge a book by its cover. Neither a borrower nor a lender be. And he tells us why. Because alone oft loses both itself and friend, you loan a friend a hundred bucks, your friend doesn't pay you back, you're out the hundred and the friend. And borrowing dulleth edge of husbandry. And your gloss for husbandry says thrift. That's impossible. Husbandry refers to something else. Husbandry refers to, well, literally, it's the breeding of animals. Okay? Metaphorically, it's hard work. Working on a farm is hard work. It's industry. This above all, that is, this last piece above everything else I've told you. To thine own self be true. And it must follow as the night to day, thou canst not then be false to any man. So what does that mean, to thine own self be true? True means right, upright. Right? It means follow your inner moral compass. Do what you know to be right. Why? Because if you do something that you know is wrong, how does that bleed out? How does that get acted out with others? Well, if you lie to yourself, you can very easily lie to others. A lot of readers take all of this advice to be bad. My own two cents, I think everything he says there is true and is good advice. In every, almost every one of those, I think probably every one of those, maybe except about the clothing, can be found in the Old Testament book of Proverbs. 
They're, they're written to be little nuggets of wisdom that one should follow, all right? The reason the words are, the advice is sometimes at least, taken to be bad is because the, of the speaker of the advice. What is Polonius' job? What does he do for a living? He's advisor to the king, which means he has to do what? Give voice to his thoughts. In other words, the implication is that for a lawful, an awful lot of this advice, he doesn't do it himself. He's a hypocrite. So, Laertes leaves, and Polonius asks, what were you two talking about? And she says, oh, it's about the Lord Hamlet. He says, tis told me he hath very oft of late given private time to you. Now, what does that tis told me mean? Are people just randomly coming up to Polonius and saying, hey, I noticed uh, Hamlet spending a lot of time with your daughter? No. The implication is he's asked. There's a phrase, we see it a couple of times in here, I have heard. I have heard that phrase, it, when you look at it in the history of the English language, it goes back to Old English. And what it always means is, I have inquired. It's not just randomly hearing voices. So if I have inquired, that's part of this. Spying, watching, observing. Because you don't only spy with your eyes. You spy with your ears. Okay? You spy with all your senses, actually. So he says, and that you've been most free with your audience. Is this true? He says, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behooves my daughter and your honor. Ophelia, you don't know who you are. I mean, We've got the family name to uphold here, all right? That's the part about as my daughter. And your honor, your reputation is at stake. Why? Well, because of what Laertes tells, told her about Hamlet and what Polonius is going to say about Hamlet is what? He's young, we assume, he's a prince, it's kind of implied he might be something of a playboy. He can do what he wants. You can't. You can't. You have to protect your honor, which in, the, in its main context means your virginity. Okay? So he asks, what is between you? Come on, tell me the truth. Uh, he hath, my lord, of late made many tenders, my 99, of his affection to me. Tenders, offers, gifts. He's written her poems. He's given her letters. He sent her cards. All of these <coughs> are what? They are expressions of his affection for her. Affection? You speak like a green girl. Don't be so naive. What's he implying? He hasn't said it yet. He's going to say it in a few minutes. She, what does she mean by affection? His friendship? His love? He says, affection? Why? It's not affection Hamlet wants, Polonius is suggesting. believe his tenders, as you call them? Do you believe what he's written in these letters and poems and cards? And she says, I do not know, my lord, what I should think. And that line has given <coughs> feminist critics of Shakespeare's plays headaches ever since it began. Feminist criticism began. Because how does it portray Ophelia? I mean, people have written articles about why Ophelia's name begins with O. Because that also represents what? Zero, no, nothing. She's a big, fat, 
nothing. She's a zilch. You can fill her in with whatever you want. And the feminist criticism is, well, it's just, you know, part of the patriarchal idea of women. There you don't mean anything without <coughs> men, etc. Okay? I think that's a bunch of nonsense, but just giving you an idea of what some say. So, she says, I don't know what I should think. I, I, I don't know what to make of Hamlet's affection. So he says, let me tell you. Think yourself a baby, and that you've taken these tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. So she used the word tenders, or tendered, tenders, sorry. Polonius then uses it again. All right. Now he uses it a third time. The third time it's used. He uses it his second time. How does he use it in this context? These are not offers. These are not gifts. These are not, you know, things bestowed upon her. He uses tenders in line 106 as money. He says, you have taken, the, taken these tenders for true pay, for real money. He says, which are not sterling. He doesn't mean like sterling meaning pure. He means as having real monetary value. He's not literally talking about money, but he's talking of things that have a real value. What is he saying these tenders really are, essentially? They're like IOUs. So he says, tender yourself more dearly. Think of yourself, hold yourself more dearly, meaning worth a higher price. Again, because he's using the money metaphor. Or, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, in other words, not to stretch the metaphor out too far, which he's already done, you will tender me, that is, you will make me a fool. So she's understood what he said. My Lord, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion. He hath importuned me. Okay. He's reached out to me. He's spoken to me. He's begged of me. He's implored me with love in honorable fashion. What does she mean in honorable fashion? In honorable ways in an honorable manner, right? In other words, he hasn't said, hey, Ophelia, you're pretty sexy. Let's jump in the sack. Strip. Polonius. Sorry, I don't mean to be so crude, but that's essentially. Polonius, I, fashion you may call it. Because when he uses fashion, what he means, fashion, like clothing that you do every day. You put them on, you take them off. He's saying his honorable fashion is something he puts on. If it's something he puts on, it's not where? It's not inside. This is an idea we're going to see later in the play. The idea that where is virtue? <laughs> virtue is inside. And yet Hamlet's going to tell his mother, even though you're not virtuous now, pretend to be. Pretend. Play act to be virtuous. You do it one day and what? It makes it a little bit easier the next day. All he's talking about there is how do you build a habit? Think about it. Um, back when I started, no, I can't use that one. Well, yeah, when I started running marathons, I didn't get up the first day and go out and run 26.2 miles. I got up the first day, I was still in pretty good shape. I got up and ran like four or five miles and slowly built up, okay? Kind of pretending at the beginning, etc. cetera. Hamlet in that scene is gonna be talking about how you build virtuous habits. Even if you're not virtuous to begin with, you can become virtuous by habit. So, she says, in response to, you can call it fashion, 
and he's given countenance to his speech, my Lord, with almost all the holy vows of heaven. You've got a gloss for countenance. Credit, support. That is, he's given credit and support for this affection or for this speech with almost all the holy vows of heaven. Well, it might mean credit or support. I think countenance, a better understanding for that word is his facial expression. She said, my Lord, if you'd seen Hamlet when he gave these almost holy vows of love, you would say he's sincere. Can people look sincere and be lying through their teeth? Hell yes. Which is what Polonius is going to get at. Springs to catch woodcocks. Traps to catch birds. Right? Woodcocks, birds, easily caught. Type of stupidity. But even though he doesn't use the word bird, woodcocks are a kind of bird. And in British culture, even today, and this goes back to the Middle Ages, the word bird is a slang term for a young woman. Okay. And so what does he do? He says, I know that when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. That is, the soul gives power to the, son, to the tongue to make Vows, oaths, promises. These blazes giving more light than heat, that is, not being real, extinct in both, even in their promise, as it is a making. You must not take for fire. You must not take these vows for truth. So, limit your audiences with Hamlet, he said. Set your entreatments at a higher rate. Why? Because Hamlet is young, and he walks with a larger tether than you may, meaning he's on a long leash. Why? He's the prince. He can pretty much do whatever he wants. You, my daughter, can't. As for his vows, 127 or 128, they are brokers. And you've got a gloss here. I don't remember what it says. Go-betweens, procurers. They are brokers, not of that die which their investment show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious bonds. His vows, Polonius is saying, Hamlet's vows, are really what? <coughs> They're pimps. His vows are the money used to secure a hooker. He wants one thing from you, Ophelia. He wants sex. He'll use whatever words he needs to get that. That's what Polonius is telling her. It's interesting he uses the word bod because coming up fairly soon in Act 2, uh, just before, uh, just after, Polonius tells the queen and king, I'll set my daughter loose on him and we will listen to their conversation. Hamlet comes in. And he has a conversation with Polonius. And they talk for a little bit. And Polonius says, do you know who I am? And he says, you're a fishmonger. Hamlet calls Polonius a fishmonger. Monger in English, British English, means seller of. You have iron mongers, wax mongers, etc. Right? Fishmonger, obviously, then one who sells fish. But there's also a pun because there's also a slang meaning. Fishmonger is one who sells sex. Not, not the person actually being sold, <laughs> but one who procures a pimp or a mistress, a madam. Okay? So, stay away from Hamlet. She says, I will. Scene four. We're out on the platform. It's around midnight. Hamlet's there, Horatio's there, Bernardo and Marcellus are there. And there is a ruckus going on in the castle. I mean, the drinking, the clattering of plates and goblets, and the singing and carousing 
is making a noise. And Horatio asks, what does this mean? Hamlet, line eight or so. Act one, scene four, line eight. The king doth wake tonight and takes his rouse, keeps him a sail, and the swaggering upspring reel, and as he drains his drafts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and pump. They're having a big party. Horatio, is it custom? That is, is this normal? Is this traditional? Is this what always happens? Hamlet, I marry is it. But to my mind, though I am native here and to the manner born, it is a custom honored in the breach and in the observance. What is he saying? And a couple lines down, he's going to tell us exactly. He's playing, he, Hamlet, via Shakespeare, is playing on this notion that the Danes are drunkards. In the old English epic poem Beowulf, which Shakespeare did not know, it was not in, available in modern English yet, um, the hero Beowulf is not Danish. He goes to the land of the Danes to rid them of the monster Grendel. And what he and what the poet reveals to the reader slash audience is every night when Danes occupy the castle, the hall, to fight Grendel, they're drunk. I mean, you get these warriors who agree every night, we'll fight Grendel, and they throw back so much booze that they are metaphorically dead to the world. I mean, out cold, inebriated. So then when Grendel comes in, he just picks them up off the ground and starts chewing on them, and they don't wake up, all right? Hamlet goes on. When he says, though I am native here and to the manor born, he means I, am, I was born in this castle, and I understand exactly this custom, this tradition. He says, I think it is more honored in the breach than the observance. It's more honored how? By not doing it every night. Why? Because they, other nations, klepa us, sorry, going back to Middle English, they call us drunkards. And with swinish raised soil, our addition, etc. He says it takes away from our glory, okay? So, the ghost comes in. <coughs> Hamlet, angels and ministers of grace defend us. Be thou a spirit of health or goblet dam, bring with the airs from heaven or blast from hell. Be thy intents wicked or charitable. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee, I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. So, angels and ministers of grace defend us. Hamlet probably looks to the sky when he does that. Why? Angels come from heaven, metaphorically, heaven's up there. Angels and ministers of grace is redundant. Ministers of grace are angels. And angels are ministers of grace. Be thou a spirit of health or goblin damned. A spirit of health. A spirit designed to bring me wholesomeness or bring health to me, or a goblin, a demon, from hell. Do you bring airs from heaven, that is, grace from heaven to me, or blasts from hell? Are your intentions wicked, to draw me down to hell, or charitable, to draw me up to heaven? Charitable just means full of love. Thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to you. Questionable looks like death. <laughs> I've got to talk to this thing. Don't let me burst in ignorance. That is, don't let me die not knowing. Burst kind of implies Blowing up, okay? Tell me why thy canonized bones hurst in death and burst their sermon. Canonized. He received the full, proper funeral. And Hamlet, the world of the play, is Catholic. It's not Protestant. 
very important to bear in mind. It's set in the past, okay? 1600 in the play is performed in 1600. In the past, you know, there wasn't any Protestantism until 1517. We'll talk about that in a few days. So he said, how did you come out of the grave? How did you come out of the dead? See, bodies, persons that were buried with the full rights of the church, it was thought, that person is what? Laid to rest. And they stay in rest, Sabbath, that's what Sabbath means, until the second coming or until the judgment day. What's up? Literally, you know. What may this mean that thou did course again in complete steel revision such the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous and we fools of nature so horribly to shake our disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of our soul? That is, I don't even have the mental framework to understand what's going on here. Explain. And the ghost beckons to Hamlet. Horatio, Marcellus say, don't go. Hamlet says, I will. So Hamlet goes off with the ghost. They go off through one door. Marcellus, Horatio, and Bernardo go off through the other door. Hamlet and the ghost then come through probably the other door. And Hamlet says, stop. Where are you leading me? I'm not going any farther. Mark me, the ghost says. Mark me. Pay attention. Take notice. I will. My hour is almost come when I do to when I to sulfurous and tormenting flame must render up myself. What it, what connotations do sulfurous and tormenting flames immediately raise in the mind? Heaven is that paradise? No, that's hell. Alas, poor ghost. Don't pity me. Lend thy series hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak. I'm bound to hear. Bound how? It's almost like he's saying, I can't move. So art thou to revenge. And thou shalt hear. What? That is, tell me what it is I'm to hear. I am thy father's spirit doomed for a certain term to walk the night. And for the day confined to fast and fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. Now that gives us a lot of information. One, I am your father. You know, Luke, I am your father. Two, I can come out at night, but during the day I must, or I am confined to fast and fires. The first gloss for the word fast is utterly asinine. It says to not partake of food. Why, why do I say that's utterly asinine? Louder? They don't eat. Ghosts don't eat. Spirits don't eat. It's one of the proofs, by the way, in the Gospels for the resurrection of Christ. Because after he's resurrected, the guys are out there fishing in Galilee. He's out there on the shore cooking fish and has some bread. They come over. They're not quite sure. They think it might not be him. And what does he do? He eats fish. Okay. To fast in fires probably does mean to go without. Not to go without food. It just means to go without. You know, modern day Catholics going up to Mardi Gras in um, Shrove Wednesday. What do you hear them say? They'll be talking, what are you giving up for Lent? You know, and some will say, I'm giving up chocolate, I'm giving up TV, I'm giving up XYZ, you know. All it means is going without something. So what does he go without, you know? During the day, everything, <laughs> he's bound in fires. Till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. What are the days of nature? When he was alive. What's he talking about? 
purgatory. This is not a Protestant idea by any means. Protestants are radically opposed to the idea of purgatory. All right? According to medieval and at Shakespeare's time, Catholic doctrine, the majority of Christians went here when they died. You go to purgatory because you're not totally clean. Once you are totally cleansed of your sins, then you go to heaven. And by the way, notice how this passage can take us back to Hamlet's opening soliloquy. Oh, that this too, too sullied flesh would thaw, melt, and resolve itself into a dew. That's the process of purgation and being made pure for heaven, right? That done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. So all the rot, all the corruption has got to be burned out. It's an image of refining. But in the Catholic system, if you go to purgatory after death, you never go down to hell. That is, you're safe. It's just you don't get to go directly to the Monopoly Go yet, right? You go to hell, you're there forever. You go to heaven, you never go down below, okay? And there is a way that you can go straight to heaven upon death. And that is if you die in what's called a state of grace. The only way you die in a state of grace is if you take your last breath immediately after receiving last rites, where a priest comes in and the priest reads and prays over you the prayers of absolution that are said after confession. It should qualification. Two ways you can die in a state of grace. One, immediately after <coughs> last rites, or two, if you die immediately after saying confession and being absolved of your sin. Okay. He says, but I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I can tell, oh boy, if I can tell you about the pains and sufferings you will endure in purgatory, he says, top of page 1257, line 16, it would harrow up thy soul. We've seen the word harrows before. And your gloss told you, lacerates the feelings. It's not what harrows mean. Harrows means to rapture the soul, to pull the soul out of, whether the soul is in the body, or is in the ground, or it's in hell. I, I mentioned the biblical idea of the harrowing of hell. Christ's spirit, when the body was in the tomb, went down to hell to pull out, to bring out all the souls of the righteous. Went down to Hades. Let me make that more specific. Hades is just the place of the dead. In the Old Testament idea, Hades is where everybody goes to when they die. There's no judgment there. It's just pretty much a place of sleep. Okay? He says it would drive you crazy if I were to tell you these things. So, he finishes. If thou did ever thy dear father love, Hamlet, oh God. Why does he say, oh God? Is he asking for strength? Probably. Is it just a simple declaration that doesn't mean anything? No. I think Hamlet says it because he knows what's coming. Revenge is foul and most unnatural murder. Murder? Murder most foul is in the best it is. But this most foul is strange and unnatural. Okay? His foul and most unnatural murder. All murder is foul. It's wrong. It's dirty. Okay? But this one we're told is unnatural. Well, in one sense, all murder is unnatural. It goes against the order of nature to kill another human being. Why? Because that human being has, quote unquote, natural rights to life, etc. Okay? How does he mean unnatural? Against nature. Why? Brother is not supposed to kill brother. 
Interestingly, what is the natural history of murder? When, when or where or who are those involved in the first murder? Garden of Eden. Cain kills his brother, Abel. Now, it's probably not, let me rephrase that, that's not in the Garden of Eden, that's right after Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden. But it's as close to the Garden of Eden as you can get. Remember Hamlet's opening soliloquy. What is the world? To him, tis an unweeded garden. Okay? This unnatural, it goes back to the first murder. Hamlet, tell me, haste me to know it. That is, tell me quickly, and what will I do? Like thoughts of love, boom, I'll do it. There won't be any space of time between my hearing and my performing this vengeance. Okay? The ghost, I find the act. That is, I think you're prepared. I think you're ready to hear him now. So he says, you heard that I died sleeping in my orchard, that a serpent came and bit me. The serpent that took my life, where is my crown? Oh, my prophetic soul. Why does Hamlet say his soul is prophetic? What else? What three words could you use to replace that with? I knew it. His first soliloquy. What does he go to? It's not just about suicide. Father's dead. He's not even dead a month yet. Mother gets married to this satyr. Talking about his uncle. He knew something wasn't right. I, that incestuous, that adulterate beast with witchcraft of his wit, traitor's kiss, blah, blah, blah. He won to a shameful lust the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. In other words, he tricked her. Go back to Polonius' advice to Ophelia. His tenders were what? <laughs> they were not pure. They were not wholesome. They were not sterling. Hamlet Sr. is suggesting. But what's he also telling us, excuse me, telling us about his wife? She wasn't all that pure either. Notice my seeming virtuous queen. Seeming, it's subjunctive. It indicates a condition contrary to fact. If she were virtuous, what would be the result? She wouldn't have married my brother. What did Hamlet say about his mother? Frailty, thy name is woman. Why? Because she posted with such dexterity, his soliloquy, to incestuous sheep. That's not about his uncle. That's about his mother. Okay? So we're told she's seemingly virtuous. Hamlet, as I mentioned, later on in late in Act 3, I believe it is, Hamlet's going to tell his mother how to become virtuous. I alluded to it previously. So, he says... He goes on. Ooh. I smell the morning air. <laughs> that is, it's about time for me to go get locked in chains and fire again. So he explains how he really died. Yes, I was sleeping in my orchard, and my brother came in and poured poison into my ear. And he died. How? Line 76. Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin. That is, cut out, cut off in the springtime of my sin. My sins were fully alive in my body. I mean, they're just blooming everywhere. Unhouseled, disappointed, unannelled, no reckoning made. 
and your gloss for all those essentially says he died what's called unshriven, that is unconfessed, unabsolved, and without last right. This is like dying in the midst, in the act of sin. In Dante's Divine Comedy, in the first part, dealing with hell, the Inferno, Dante meets a couple, a young man and a young woman. These are real people, they really live, okay, who are caught in the act of adultery. She, the wife of a man, her name is Francesca, is having sex with Paolo. I think, I'm not positive, it's been a while since I taught it. I'm pretty sure Paolo is her husband's brother. So, okay. The husband finds them uh, in, what's the phrase, in delicto flagrante, in the act, and stabs them with his sword, kills them both. They go to hell where they are in the whirlwind of lustful passion for all eternity. He's always trying to reach her, he never can. Okay? Dante speaks to them, to them and they tell their story. They're there, not only because of their lust, sinful lust and all that kind of stuff, but they weren't able to say confession or be shriven. So he says, I was sent to my account, that is judgment, not the final judgment, the temporary. Catholics have a temporary judgment. That's why you go to one of these, okay? Um, sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. What's he implying? If I'd been able to confess, I wouldn't be burning in fire during the daytime. So, he says, if thou hast nature in thee, bear it not. Let not the royal bed of Denmark be a couch for luxury and damned incest. Don't let it happen. But, he says, howsomever thou pursues this act, taint not thy mind. Pursues this act. How you get vengeance, how you get revenge. Don't let it taint your mind. So what does that mean to taint your mind? Let's say I brought in a big glass jar, five gallon glass jar, full of white paint. If I were to get a drop of any other color paint and drop that, a single drop in that white paint, it would taint that entire five gallons. Taint means to make impure. So. Do not make impure your mind, Hamlet. Don't let this, what's he really saying? Don't let this make you go crazy. Don't let this be the all-encompassing focus of your energies. And then he says, and leave your mother alone. Don't do anything to your mother. Let heaven take care of her. Ghost leaves. Was saying, remember. all you hosts of heaven up there, O oh, earth down here, what else? Shall I couple hell? That is, shall I bring all these hosts together? All the hosts of heaven, the angelic beings, all the hosts of earth, all the people, all the hosts of hell, all the demons. Oh, fie, hold, hold my heart. It's the third time we've heard Hamlet say something like, but break my heart, Calm down, soul. Now it's hold. Hold my heart. Why? Hamlet's about to lose it. Or is he? Remember thee? I, thou poor ghost, whilst memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. In this distracted globe. Your footnote actually has this right. He should point to his head. But some readers say, this distracted globe, Hamlet does this. And it's not the globe here. It's the world. The world is distracted. What does it mean to be distracted? Literally, it means to be drawn, like dragged, away. Away means off the right path. The entire world, in that sense, 
is distracted since the beginning, since Adam and Eve. But here he probably more specifically means his mind. His mind is out of focus. It's distracted. It's not focused on the right thing. So he says, yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all songs of books, all forms, all precious past that youth and observation taught me there. Everything I've learned from birth into this moment, it's like a mind wipe. All that is gone. And what gets, what replaces everything he's learned before? Kill quiet. What are the ghosts commanded to do? Taint not thy mind. Hamlet hasn't just tainted his mind. He's reformatted it and made the drive only work according to kill Claudius. Okay? So, Horatio Marcellus Bernardo come in. They talk back and forth. And Hamlet says, give me one poor request. They say, whatever you want. Don't tell anybody what you've seen. Oh, not a problem. Swear on it. And we hear the ghost rumble underneath the stage. Swear. And during the rest of the scene, we hear them swear several times. Okay? Then Hamlet says, in response to Horatio's 164, oh, day and night, but this is wondrous strange. What is it that's wondrous strange? The ghost is telling them to swear on Hamlet's sword. Why on his sword? It's shaped like a cross. All swords are, except for Roman swords, because Roman swords didn't have necessarily that kind of hilt. Just a pommel with a little guard on the end, okay? Hamlet, and therefore as a stranger give it welcome. That is, Horatio says, this is strangest, the strangest wonder strange, as a stranger give it welcome. He's giving it the idea there of hospitality. Or to use a Greek form, xenophilia. We don't hear that word today. We only hear about xenophobia. People who are afraid of aliens, strangers, foreigners. Xeno coming from xenia, Greek, which means other, foreign, stranger, alien. Xenophilia, love of others. Hospitality, this is an ancient, ancient idea. It goes back to literally 5,000 BC, if not earlier. And then it's the idea, we see it expressed in all of what are called the Indo-European literatures. That's the languages and literatures of Russia, modern day India, um, pretty much all the European nation, the United States and such. And it's the idea that if somebody comes knocking at your door at night, and you don't know them, you let them in. You give them shelter, you give them food, you give them rest, you give them comfort. Why? St. Paul puts it this way. The idea finds its way in scripture. Because you entertain angels unawares. You don't know it, but the person you've actually given rest and comfort and lodging to is an angel. In ancient Greek literature, for example, in the Odyssey, it's the gods. And so, someone strange comes knocking at your door, if you slam that door on them, you can be damn sure you are going to be punished. All right? So, therefore, as a stranger give it welcome, there are more things in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Meaning, Horatio, you've got a little view of the world. You need to expand your vision. So, he says, last two minutes. However odd or strange I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think me to put an antic disposition on, don't give out you know what I'm doing. Your gloss for antic is idiotic. It says fantastic. What is a fantastic disposition? When I feel fantastic, man, I'm, I'm elated. It's not what he means. He means crazy. Absolutely out of his mind, crazy. But what's he talking about? 
as I shall hereafter think meet to put on, to pretend, to play at, to act. So one of the big critical questions is, from here on out, is everything Hamlet does pretending to be crazy? How do we know when he's pretending when he isn't pretending? Is Hamlet ever really mad, meaning crazy? Hmm. So, the ghost leaves, they swear on the ghosts, uh, they swear on Hamlet's sword again, and Hamlet says, let's go in together. Still your fingers on your lips, I pray, the time is out of joint. Still your fingers on your lips. We still have that symbol today. The time is out of joint, O cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. What does he mean the time was out of joint? Think that great chain of being. The link is missing. And he's saying, I was born to fix this. Hmm. Like fated? Well, fate isn't a Christian, Catholic, or Protestant idea. But predestination is. God's governing of the universe is. Hamlet seems to be saying, I was born at a particular time, particular place, to do what? To fix a problem. The idea is that the problem existed before he was even born. All kinds of deep theological issues. Okay, we'll stop there. I thought we'd get a little bit farther. We will pick up with Act 2 on Monday. Uh, if you haven't already, read through...